Welcome back to season three of ASD Market Week's podcast, Let's Talk a Little Shop, with your host, me, Emily Lewis. We're going to tackle the hard subjects. So buckle up and get ready for season three. We're going to have a lot of fun. Well, welcome back to another episode of ASD Market Week's podcast, Let's Talk a Little Shop. So today we have a really fascinating guest, and I'm really excited for this conversation because not only is Cole Darty the Senior Vice President of Exhibitor Marketing for the Dallas Market Center, he has also been with the Dallas Market Center and in this industry for so many years that I am excited to learn from you and your experience. In case you guys don't know what the Dallas Market Center is, which I'm sure most of our audience does, but just in case you don't, uh, the DMC, as we like to call it, is touted as the world's most comprehensive wholesale trade resource, housing products ranging from home, gift, lighting, apparel, accessories, and more. And I'm sure you saw that I had to read that because you guys had so have so many categories. And Cole, you've had over 20 years of experience working at the DMC. So I'm going to turn it over to you. What do you think, you know, and I'm going to hit you with the hard question in the beginning. What do you think is one of the most vital lessons that you have learned about this industry over the past 20 years? Well, first of all, thanks. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and to be able to talk shop. And, you know, talking shop really means talking about the business of trade shows. But it's really to get to the heart of your question is to talk about relationships. And yes. the reason I've been with the Market Center for so long is that, as you know, it's an amazing place to build relationships that help people and help businesses thrive. And so whether it's on the buyer side or on the exhibitor side, the key learning that I've had over the years is that you can establish great relationships individually, but we can serve as a bridge between the buyers and sellers. And over time, you really get to see them struggle, thrive, go through growing pains, change, whatever ha may happen from the time they're a startup, even to a 20, 30, 50, 100 year old company. It's a dynamic place uh, full of opportunity for people that have an idea or who maybe they're a second generation working to take a business to a new level. Yeah. It's the case both for retail buyers as well as for brands that are there. So that's been the foundation of my, my 20 plus years. Of the Market Center is, is relationships. You're really only as good as your last show. You're only yes. as good as yes. the last few months yep. in business. But more importantly, to your point, you're looking ahead mm -hmm. and you're viewed as a partner with the exhibitor community and with yes. the, the buyers too because of the scale, history, size, expertise, all these things you bring into the mix mm -hmm. to continue to try to help them and, and partner with them. Yes. We're a very hands-on organization uh, across all the industries that we have in the show. Tell me a little bit about yourself and how you ended up in this role. Well, to go all the way back in terms of where I grew up, I grew up here in the Dallas area. I'm actually a fifth generation Texan and pretty proud of that. We've got a lot of, of new people that have moved into the Dallas area and a lot of new people even with the Market Center on my team. Yeah. Um, well, there are a few of us who are, are native Texans and, and the multi-generations of being a Texan, I'm, I'm really quite proud of. Yeah. yeah. Went off to school, uh, went to college, even went to graduate school. And then afterwards, I just began to think, what could I do with my life? And I've always been into writing and okay. into promotional type of writing. And so I um, had a good friend here in Dallas who was part of a public relations agency that no longer exists actually. And so uh, I got hired on to be with a PR agency in Dallas and we served high tech companies, smaller okay. startup high tech companies um, and jumped through hoops to help a lot of smaller companies, mm -hmm. a lot of media attention and events, mm -hmm. um, went through several rounds of, of layoffs with that company, of course, over the years and fell victim to that. So I've been there, been out of work for a while. Yeah. And honestly, it was a network of friends and connections and a good friend of mine 
uh, his wife was running marketing at the Dallas Market Center and said, hey, we've got a position available if you want to throw your hat in the ring. And that was uh, 22 years ago. I walked into the Market Center having grown up in Dallas, but I'd never been inside the Dallas Market Center until I interviewed for a job to be public relations director. Immediately mm. got it, was excited about it, had lots and lots of questions and jumped in as public relations director. Um, I think, as I tell my colleagues now, it takes about a year simply to observe a full cycle of trade shows yeah. and, and understand all those acronyms and the lingo. And because we serve multiple industries, yeah. apparel can be very different from lighting, can be very different from daily interior design. Uh, so it takes a while, but yeah. uh, I embraced yeah. it and have, have enjoyed those 22 years uh, including lots of projects in Dallas, plus we've done some consulting projects uh, around the world, which has been great, and really bringing new things into Dallas. When I say new things, you know, within the industries we serve, but also additional shows. I mentioned earlier, uh, Western and Equestrian. Mm -hmm. Those were added during the pandemic and have just mm -hmm. been tremendous. What do you feel like the biggest misconception of those coming into the industry. And now we obviously service two sides of our industry. It's, you know, the buyers who are buying the product and then the wholesalers who are actually producing the product. But on either side of that, of the industry that we service, what do you feel like a big misconception for those newcomers is? Well, I'll take it a couple of different bites at that. Um, I think one misconception on the exhibitor side, there is Often, I've, and I'm just going to be blunt about this, I think there's often a misconception among the new exhibitors that you set up your booth in Dallas or elsewhere and, you know, the buyers are going to immediately flock to your booth with not a ton of preparation and work. Yeah. That's a misconception. We're trying harder now to onboard and help exhibitors succeed by dispelling that misconception and talking about the ways in which all of us together need to do a lot of homework and work together, not only to drive traffic, but attention into the neighborhoods and the trade show booths. And that starts with the exhibitor community and what their responsibility is. I couldn't have said that better. I love that. Um, obviously at the DMC, you oversee a team and anytime you're in a leadership position where you oversee a team, there are always challenges, um, especially as the market and the industry changes, people come in and they go out. What has been maybe one motto or one, you know, rule or guideline that you feel you have passed along to your team about this industry and what we do that has held true for the last, you know, 20 plus years that you've been doing this? Well, sure. And, and obviously, I think, you know, the, the cycle of people seeking jobs has become faster and faster uh, for all companies, I think, yes. and all agencies, all, all providers. But one of the things we start out with in an interview with candidates is to talk mm -hmm. about a couple of things. Number one is, and I mentioned this earlier, is, hey, it takes a year really to experience a full cycle of shows. So, you know, just be prepared for that. Enjoy the ride. Soak mm -hmm. it in. Mm -hmm. And and let's let's talk about what that first year looks like. Yeah. Number two is, and this is so important, and that's career track. That, yeah. Uh, I'm a living example of it. Our CEO is a living example of that. Is staying with a company for a period of time and advancing mm -hmm. um, step by step by step. If you put in the hard work, just to be honest, and the time in with it. Mm -hmm. uh, that can help too. But mm -hmm. most importantly, I think, is really uh, working as a community together in as a company. And what I've learned over the years in terms of a team, a department, mm -hmm. a division, a company is, you know, having this idea of working together as a community. Yes. In the spirit of that community, I think, for us in Dallas, and I'm sure it's the same for you guys too, is really instilling a mentality of working on behalf of the customer and sharing those stories, which I think are so important, is yeah. sharing those stories of customers and mm -hmm. feedback from customers. Hey, both bad and good. We love yeah. the good part of that is that yeah. the stories of customers that have had <laughs> success, we, we've had a role in. 
and yeah. recognizing the value that you bring to that because I know for folks and I'm you know now in my 50s but I know for a lot of employees coming in their 20s and 30s mm -hmm. the value system and understanding what you stand for matters more than ever so yeah. standing for things is so important but how you translate that into good storytelling around your customers and around your mission is truly critical. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a great point. We, you know, at ASD, it, it's interesting. We love and everybody loves the good feedback. We love it. We love the testimonials. We love the good feedback, but we actually have sessions after every single one of our shows where we dive really deep into those negative comments and take those really seriously and, and not to, you know, get down about the job that, that we've done or, or the event, but it really is taking it as an opportunity. Before we go into any future strategy meetings, that's the first thing that we do is we dive into the negative comments and those really shape our opportunities for our next event. So. Well, I, they I, do. I actually, this morning, uh, before this uh, conversation with you, we actually had an exhibitor meeting. Uh, yeah. This is among our design showrooms who are open daily. Mm -hmm. It is such a positive group to sit around a table and talk about our January markets. And to your point, note some feedback of what we can all do better. But at the same time, you know, signal, OK, let's look ahead to what's upcoming and things we can do to work together on. But it's that flow that just that honest flow of information back and forth between yeah. the exhibitor and management which really helps and being very open about things we can work on and things we may disagree on too. Post COVID, obviously, you know, the industry has changed COVID. We definitely were, you know, in our houses and not interacting and, and thing, there are some things that I think changed for the better. And there, there are some things that I think we're still learning as a society and especially as our industry, but how important do you feel that in person, events and meetings and business that is done, whether at the DMC or whether at, you know, a large event like ASD, how important do you feel that is to our industry today? There are so many efficiencies that can take place online, but there's mm -hmm. no substitute uh, for touching feeling. I mean, how could you pick up a new candle line without smelling the fragrance? How yeah. could you pick up a new uh, collection for in, in apparel without looking at how sheer or how soft the fabric is? Yeah. Uh, there's no substitute for it. So uh, yeah. we agree that, that the in-person you know, truly matters, supported by digital, no doubt. Yes, 100%. It's much like, it's much like we talk about AI these days. It's our mm -hmm. co-pilot, right? Anything digital is our co-pilot. Mm -hmm. But you start with the, the real and the in-person. Yeah. I often say that it is the scenario of I can send you 100 emails or I can pick up the phone and in five minutes call you and have the same conversation and we accomplish the same thing. Which would you rather do? And That's so right. there there is a need. And I, I firmly believe that in-person events and just socialization and human to human interaction, there's there's never going to be a substitute for it. Um, but I think another point too, I'll just come sorry to interrupt, but, no, go ahead. uh, you know, another element of course that, that we've seen over the years is diversification by retailers carrying different product types. Yes. And, you know, when a gift store decides to carry some footwear or some fashion accessories, or when an apparel store decides to, you know, carry gift product, there's an element of discovery that needs to take place. Mm -hmm. and relationship building foundation yes. needs to take place. And for us, that happens in person in a marketplace, to be able to survey trends, discover new products, and honestly, to talk to the rep and to talk to the principals and understand what's going to work yes. or not going to work um, and go from there. But that discovery element, and I want to mention that as being so important for retailers to take place, especially across other categories. Yeah. And so that, has to take place we think best inside a physical marketplace yes i could not agree more and as a consumer if i'm taking off my trade show hat and i'm putting on my consumer hat as a consumer when i go into a store i expect for a clothing store to have you know lip gloss or a greeting card or a journal or a notebook or a mug or a magnet whatever it is i expect for there to be 
some of those high to low margin building products that I can easily get as a gift, even if I'm going into an apparel store to look for something very specific for myself. And so I think not only is there a mix of product category now across retail, but there's also a mix of price point. And I think that is really important that most stores now have some type of mix of price point or they're more open to a mix of price point based on what their consumer wants. So that, and I'll also add that, you know, for the independent retailer, and again, our bread and butter in Dallas, we do a lot of business with major stores, which is great, but the bread and butter independent retailer that we have also wants to find something unique yes. and special. Yes. And yes. So it's going to let them stand out. And so uh, as a marketplace, you know, our leasing team is scouting trade shows and fairs and every sort of element yep. of things that will find unique product. But for us, we also want to discover what we have that is uh, artisan or one of a kind too. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. hundred percent. Is there a trend that you see amongst generations in this industry, whether it's on the retail side or the wholesale side that you're having to shift any mindsets around trade shows or in-person events? Yeah, the, the generational you know, differences um, are really important to recognize. And, and I will say that, you know, obviously in the business of fashion and the business of gift, mm -hmm. you know, there are more younger people going into that business, just to be honest, than, for example, the business of, of lighting, but interior design, skewing younger, gift, apparel, what we've found is, I mean, we all know that social media is where it's at relative to content and relative to inspiration. So you got to lean in on that. Mm -hmm. But here's something that I think we begin to emphasize as well for generationally, and that is um, understanding that we get it. And especially mm -hmm. as a company that's been around for more than six decades, mm -hmm. one of those you talked earlier about misconceptions is that, you know, we got to keep our finger on the pulse and especially for the younger buyer to make sure that we have a point of view and we get it and we can help them mm -hmm. with trends and with yeah. new products that can better represent the product categories and can help them sell through to their younger customer. Yeah. So that's really important. I will say that as well there's a, a sense of, you know, values for younger customer and being able to offer mm -hmm. more eco-friendly to be able to offer more yes. uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, black owned businesses, yes. those kinds of elements, which are so critical right now and are in demand, yes. but they just make sense for values. That's something as well. We're sensitive to, to creating and emphasizing as well uh, because I mean, it matters and yeah. whatever matters relative to the customer needs to matter for the management. I do think that the one thing that that we continue to see with, you know, different demographics and different generations is that we do continue to continue to see an emphasis on social media and an emphasis on content and how content is being consumed going from, you know, long form written, um, you know, newspapers and white papers and those things to very short form video style content. People really want to see things quick. Their attention spans are very um, quick these days and they want to see things quick and fast. So Amen. that's right. Yeah. What do you feel like you would like to see in terms of maybe collaboration out there or what have you seen that maybe went sideways that you, you know, you thought this was going to be a great collaboration, whether it's industry or retail or, you know, celebrity, and maybe it didn't work. I'll give a ex great example that recently we've done, and that's working with PGA of America on okay. our men's show. So okay. the PGA of America moved their headquarters here, oh. just north of Dallas. And of course they have the big PGA show in Orlando, yeah. but also they have a regional, or I'm saying a regional, but a smaller event that's a summit that takes place here. Okay. Their dates aligned very closely with our men's market. Well, hello, that's a natural partnership to say, yeah. Why can't we work together? Golf shops may want men's product that we have. Our men's stores may want some golf product or lifestyle product that's showing there. Let's figure out a way to work together, which we did and was tremendously successful. Mm -hmm. and we'll continue doing that.
we also had a 10 year partnership working with the Santa Fe folk art market, oh. uh, folk artists around the world bringing yes. in product for our June total home and gift market. And that has been incredible because it's unique product, but also it's helping people mm-hmm. around the world with unique. Products. So that's, you know, yeah. that's one of the examples of things that have worked. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but that's yeah. okay. You you benefit from the ones that work. You move on from the ones that, that don't. You are yeah. able to, to keep moving on that. But uh, the idea of working with influencers, by the way, influencers for us might be a big national global name, but for us all the time, an influencer might be just a great retailer that yeah. people really respect the point of view of. And so... I don't like to call them micro influencers because they make a, a big impact. Yeah. But sometimes it's just people that get it and are really good customers who, yeah. you know, they're already influential in their community. What can they bring to help other retailers or help us as a marketplace, you know, tap into trends and tap into what works. We created a new series this June called speaking of retail, where we yeah. brought in some fantastic retailers to lead a one-on-one group discussion, retailer to retailer, about what's working for social media, rep relationships, e-commerce. It was fantastic. It's the first time we did it. We're going to continue to do it. But yeah. you know, allowing these retail influencers to take charge is just tremendous. Yeah, and that's a really great point. You know, it's funny we we've done some similar programs too at ASD and um, rolling out similar programs where we have very influential retailers that are taking on over some of our educational sessions because we feel like who better to talk about the industry, what they're seeing, their do's and don'ts, what they've learned than the retailer themselves. Um, and then we also have some tracks around influencers and the same thing The influencers are, you know, kind of running through their successes and what they found and how, what matters to them about working for brands. So I agree with you. You don't have to be a celebrity to be an influencer. I think in our industry, the influencers are the ones that are doing the business and are creating paths for the new, um, you know, industry um, leaders to, to come in the next, you know, five, 10 years. I do want to know, you know, maybe what are some words that come up to you, for you or some thoughts when you think about 2024 as a whole? Well, 2024 as a whole, um, you know, I, I think if you'd asked me that question six months ago, I probably would have used a little different set of terms than I do now. Yeah. If you'd asked me six months ago, I probably would have used a well-worn phrase like cautious optimism that everybody uses. But I will say that going into the holiday and the numbers yes. that we all saw of the reports on consumer spending, the yeah. most recent numbers on consumer confidence, the most recent numbers we saw for our January events in Dallas, right. um, I'll move from cautious optimism into enthusiasm, to be honest with you, just based upon uh, the momentum and based upon where we seem to be economically as a country, where we seem to be regionally, economically, and what we're seeing as a marketplace. Now, that being said, that doesn't dismiss all the headwinds that still exist out there. We know there are economic headwinds, whether it's interest rates or whether it's uh, elements such as having an election year. I mean, these things throw us sideways sometimes when looking at performance uh, over an entire year. Yeah. That being said, you know, we're definitely enthusiastic down here in Dallas about uh, yeah. conditions economically and also about the road this year, uh, just based upon the the success we had in January through our fashion markets, lighting, home, mm-hmm. gift, Western equestrian, it was hitting on all cylinders. Yeah. Yeah. I, I share that sentiment. I think coming out of the holidays, there was definitely enthusiasm around the numbers and how, how unpredictable we thought those numbers were going to be. And then how pleasantly surprised we were with the reality of consumers are still out there and they're still shopping and business is still being done. So um, I, I second that enthusiasm is a great word that I would use for 2024. Um, if you could recommend three stores in Dallas, and I know this is going to be a hard one for you because you can't be partial. There's a lot of Dallas retailers that 
that come to the DMC. But if you could recommend three stores for someone who's never visited Dallas and they're coming to Dallas, what stores would you recommend to them? Well, I, I, I've got a, let me, let me mention four. Okay. Uh, you get, you get four. Mind, That's fine. Mind is stunning. There's a incredible furniture store north of town Okay. North of town, that's my my Texas roots coming out. North of town, uh, up in up in the Frisco area, which by the way, the Frisco, which is about forty minutes north of downtown Dallas, is just okay. on fire economically. There's a wonderful home furnishings uh, store there called IBB, and okay. Shay and her family. And by the way, this is a company that's been around for decades, but they've grown tremendously as a furniture home furnishings accents company that also has on staff dozens of interior designers. Okay. It's incredible to see it in operation and what they have closer in to Dallas. uh, There's a a fantastic uh, fashion and gift retailer called favor the kind. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's on Henderson Avenue, uh, which does an incredible job with what's trending. I mean, obviously the, the the contemporary western trend remains really hot yeah you could say it's hot here in texas but it's always been fantastic but it's it's hot nationally they do a great job with that and right down the street from there is a wonderful small home retailer called coco and dash yes i know coco and dash they're great yeah yeah they help us with our speaking of retail series oh yeah they're great for home accents and that was wonderful. And then I want to flip all the way over for the fourth suggestion over to the unbelievable Highland Park Village, mm. which is a very high end shopping center, yeah. uh, which is the home of, you know, Chanel and Hermes. But there is yeah. an independent in there uh, called the Conservatory. Yes. Yes. And the Conservatory yeah. is run by Brian yeah. and his team. And they're upper echelon, higher end. But the attention to detail and to bringing in a very unique product that that is just tremendous, plus the the entire environment. And they have a small cafe. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the people that work there, great personalities. It just is fantastic to visit. So that would be my short list of, of places, both in the burbs and also down here in the city. I love that. You picked two of my favorites and I don't know the other two. So now next time I'm in Dallas, I'm going to have to to visit those two. But you picked two of my favorites. So There's I so love- many to choose from, though. I mean, like I said, there I've are. been a beneficiary of a lot of, of new retail uh, as well. I need to continue to get out there and, and drive and walk and look and yeah. see as well, because there's just a tremendous number of new stores that have opened up. If you could pick one trend for 2024 for retailers, and it could be something that is, you know, it doesn't have to be on the nose. You know, I know you had talked about the Western trend. It can be really something that's more aspirational, like more storytelling. What would that trend be for retailers in 2024, do you think? Well, you know, I would say that the trend that I would pick for retailers really is uh, the unique. and that's because independent retailers have got to stand out. And when I say unique, I'm using that in a very broad term. I don't mean necessarily that it's a craftsperson that has mm-hmm. crafted an individual painting, although it could be, you know, you yeah. just yeah. to have something from your local community who's a painter yeah. is great, but it could be something just from a smaller company or a company you haven't seen before or something that yeah. helps you stand out that's on trend that helps you tell your story because I think most important for independent retail is having product that really amplifies your own story as a retailer and who you stand for. Uh, If it's something that's coming out of left field, that's fine to try that, but to find something unique that reflects your own point of view as a retailer is in sync with that. That's a win, win right there. And we love trying to help people discover that. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely agree. I think um, an, a really important part of opening a retail environment is your personal storytelling that happens through that retail environment and making sure that you are unique um, as it relates to to your neighbors. And, you know, obviously not taking your eye off the prize too much, because when you concentrate on the competition too much, then you lose sight of your own storytelling. 
But I, I definitely think that those stores that tend to catch my eye as a consumer are the ones where I walk in and I discover something new. I hear a story maybe about a great brand that I've been buying for years, but I didn't know that story or that ethos or what was behind the brand. And I learned something about them. So it doesn't always have to be the brand that you haven't ever heard of, but it's how do you position that brand so that your consumer learns something new about them? Or there's a new story that they can then attach themselves to. So I agree. That's right. And that can be a best-selling item. It doesn't have to be yeah. Uh, yeah. an artist. It can be something best-selling, but you're crafting it or presenting it or merchandising in a way, maybe yeah. even together with something more one of a kind. Yeah. But the point is that that, that mix uh, and, and really finding unique items to mix in, yep. I think, is, is great, great uh, merchandising and it's great storytelling for you as a retailer. 100%. There's, you know, an amazing um, retailer out of New York, and she's been there for quite a few years called Story, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And Rachel, yes. Yeah, Rachel's amazing. And her concept is so brilliant. Um, and I love every time I'm in New York, it's, you know, you have there's certain retailers that you have to visit just for the inspiration. And she's one of those. So. Yeah. And, you know, in, in Texas, you know, whether if you're in Austin, you go to Stag. If yes. you're in Houston, yeah. you go to Cool yeah. Lenscombe. I mean, yes. there are people that really have a great track record of creating unique experiences in their store that you want yeah. to go see. What have they done now? How are they doing it? Yeah. I, that's what I. All of us, I think, have to challenge ourselves in 2024 to get out of our shells and go yes. experience these things. We can bring value back to our own businesses. And that's hard. It's hard to leave my desk oftentimes and walk into the market center itself. And it's just below me to look at what's new, much yeah. less to go out yeah. on the road and visit stores and get a, a finger on the pulse of, of what's happening in retail. But that's incumbent on all of us. Yeah. If you could sit down with anyone right now for 30 minutes and ask them any question you wanted to, and you had 30 minutes of their time, who would it be and why? Um, I, I think that that would have to be Mickey Drexler. So, oh, you know, it. in terms of retail it. heroes, none is higher. And maybe a kind of an obvious answer, but Mickey Drexler. And yeah. what I would, would ask him and talk with him about really would be about um, consumer uh, sentiment and about merchandising and about the understanding of, of stickiness for retail, because that applies to market centers as well. Yes. And just the fantastic track record that he has uh, relative yes. to experiences and merchandising in a way that gets people excited uh, about a retail experience. So that would be number one for me would be Mickey Drexler. Um, you know, there are other legendary retailers that, that I've, had, I've had a chance to sit down with and talk with, whether it's um, Roger Horchow or mm, uh, Alan Kostrom yeah. or folks that have been in the Dallas area like that, who and, and plenty of people from Neiman Marcus, for example, as well, that have done a fantastic job. But I think, you know, Mickey would be my, my 30 minute. Quick, quick, right, lightning round with Mickey would be fantastic. Yeah, I think that's a great choice. And for those that might be um, on the younger side, they might not know who Mickey Drexler is, which if you don't and you're in retail, shame on you. Um, but Mickey Drexler is responsible for brands like J. Crew and Gap and really some of the innovation that came behind, especially J. Crew's resurgence. And, and, and now his son has a company, Alex Mill. And so yeah. I mean, he's consulting his son in a next generation company. So, yeah. 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 Um, so that's, that's a great, I, I agree with you on that sentiment. Um, if you could go back and tell your 18 year old self one thing, what would it be? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> So many things, I'm sure. You got to be careful what you say, right? Um, so, you know, I, I had the opportunity for several years. I actually taught a course at SMU in the evening. Okay. Um, and I, I taught that course on communication and marketing. And one of the things I would tell the students there who are, again, you know, 19, 20, 21 years old, it's okay if you don't have it all figured out. Yes. It's okay to take a leap of faith, to be unsure of yourself, to not have certainty. I mean, the world is uncertain enough as it is for yourself. It's okay to 
feel your way through these decisions you're making and, and make some mistakes too along the way and to figure out what's next uh, yeah. and, and move in a different direction. You know, certainty doesn't come to us I don't think at any point in life, much less if you're 18 years old, 20 years old, trying to figure out life and trying to figure out career, mm -hmm. you know, the, the tremendous pressures that come out uh, upon teenagers today. Yes. I don't think that, that social media helps a whole lot when you see people that look like they have it all figured out, that yes. look like they're completely put together. But I love the brands that are peeling back uh, the layers and pointing out that all that's online is not what it seems to be. Yeah. You know, whether it's Dove or other consumer products companies yeah. that have said, let's get honest about this, that, that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of veneer in that. So I would really say to, to those folks and to myself at that age that it's okay to be uncertain and just to move ahead with energy and with purpose that you think. And if you're not right, then just pivot, move in a different direction. It's okay. I love that piece of advice. I think one of the top qualities that I look for in leaders is a leader that asks questions and a leader that comes to the table and says, you know what? I don't know the answer to that, but we're going to find it and I'll get back to you because I think that that shows strength and I think that it shows a great deal of wisdom um, instead of pretending that we always have the answers because none of us do. So I think that that, I think that's a great statement. Um, just, you just have to keep moving and you have to keep, uh, I always like to say failing forward, just, just keep doing it. So well, Cole, it was so nice to talk to you. Um, obviously as two people that are in, you know, very similar, but different, um, worlds, um, it, it's really nice to always talk shop, um, about the industry. And I'm very excited to hear that you're enthusiastic for 24 because we are too. So, Okay. Uh, yeah. So thank you for joining us today. And, um, you know, we, I hope to see you in Dallas. I'm going to check out those stores you mentioned, but I hope to see you in Dallas soon. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Be sure to subscribe to ASD Market Week's Let's Talk a Little Shop, a podcast that can be found on iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, or Spotify. See you there.